Hi, my name is Dailene Adamas. I'm sitting here with Miss Clark. Today's date is May 24th. It's a Friday, and we're in Holy Trinity High School. Hi, Miss Clark. Hey, Chachi. Thank you so, so much for coming and talking to me. This is so fun. <laughs> yes. Thank you for actually saying yes. Um, <laughs> how was your day? Good. Today was roving, so it was crazy busy in the morning, but now it is over. It went well. I feel good. Yes. It'll be a good long weekend. Okay. That sounds pretty good. I'm like already, today was so hectic, but <laughs> I have a few questions for you if you don't mind me asking. Go for it. Okay. So my first question is, what did you think you were going to be when you were younger? And did you ever think you would work in this type of field? Hmm. That's a good question. I think when I was really little, I used to play teacher with my dolls, of <laughs> course, because I think that's all any little girl really knows, right? Yeah. <laughs> I knew I didn't want to be a nurse, which is what my mom was, because that's just gross. But <laughs> So all I, the other thing I knew was teachers, right? And then by the time I got to high school, I had discovered journalism. Um, I went away part of my senior year of high school and did an internship in Springfield, Illinois. Um, and I got placed into a press office, and so I got to meet all these journalists and write uh, press releases. And it was there that someone told me, hey, you should go to University of Missouri. And I got really excited about going to journalism school there. So from there on, I knew that's what I wanted to do. Um, and I didn't really think about any other option until much later when I decided I needed to get out of the newsroom. <laughs> what do I do with this journalism degree now? And that's how I ended up in communications. So who reached out to you about Holy Trinity? Well, I found the job posting for Holy Trinity on a website called npo.net and I read all about it and it seemed really interesting. It seemed like a job where I could use all of my skills and I wanted to be able to do what I was best at um, and it seemed like a place I could really align with the mission. Um, I, I really care for our families and if I could use the things I'm good at to help help you help any of our families um, have a great experience and achieve your own dreams, then what more could I ask for? Okay. Um, what is your favorite part of working at HC and what's your least favorite part? Uh, my favorite part is definitely the students. Um, I love you guys. <laughs> I'm going to cry. Um, I really do. I'm so incredibly proud of our students. I think watching them come in freshman year and then start to grow and change and realize um, number one that you're not alone um, and that no one wants you to struggle through life alone but b you have so much potential right there's huge hope for every single one of your futures and if you just grab for it you can have it right and so to get to not only watch but be a little bit of a part of that journey is an absolute privilege so that's that's why I stay. I think I, that's why a lot of people are here. Um, the hardest part about my job, other than the students, because <laughs> you guys could definitely be heartbreakers too. Um, you know, a school is a really interesting place to work because everyone is here for a common mission, um, but we are all kind of siloed, right? You think uh, every teacher is the king or queen of her own classroom and um, you know you've got different departments we all have to work together but we're separated um, spatially throughout the building and so just getting everybody to collaborate getting everybody on the same page um, getting everybody organized for events like robing right uh, can be a lot of work but you know those hard times are still a privilege yeah it's still my honor to do that okay um what is your fam what was your family like when you were young and how is it different from now? Hmm. So when I was little, I mean I grew up with my mom and dad at home. I have an older sister and a younger brother. We grew up in Orland Park, so a southwest suburb. Um like hundred first 51st in Harlem and my grandma lived two blocks away and she would come and take care of us get us to school in the morning, meet us um, from the bus in the afternoon, because my mom worked nights and my dad worked days. Um, my dad owned like a trucking, a trucking business, he had his own truck. And then when I was in first grade, he decided to go back to school and become a nurse uh, as well. So he was in school for several years and then 
graduated, so I got to see someone graduate from college. My own parent graduated from college when I was in grade school, which was very inspirational. Um, and then, you know, he worked like 12 hour shifts, you know, really long shifts. Um, so their schedules, they tried to organize their schedules so when one was working, the other one was off. Um, but, you know, they also have to sleep. <laughs> so my, I call her Nana. My Nana was a really huge part in helping raise us. Um, and I had other extended family that was in the area. And we saw them on like holidays and stuff, but um, not, as, not as frequently. So it's different now. My parents are still in Orland Park, but um, my mom cares for her mom, um, my other grandma, um, 24-7. So she has dementia. So that's very different. That's changed the family a lot. My nana passed away about um, three years ago now, and I still miss her every day because she was so close to us. And then my siblings are both in Texas. My sister is in Dallas with her husband. And my brother and his wife and my two nephews live in um, a small town ca called Wingate outside Abilene, which is not that much bigger of a town. <laughs> um, so they're really far away. And I, I never imagined that. I always thought that they'd be here in the Chicago area and I would be probably, you know, reporting around the world. And then I would come home to see them. Um, but now they're the ones who live far away. And I miss them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so with your siblings, were you guys super close when you were young? Yeah, I <laughs> I think so. I'm the middle child. And so in a family with three kids, the dynamics always are kind of shifting. It's usually like two against one, but right. But the who those two are keeps changing. <laughs> um, so being with Kristen, my older sister, us being the two girls. We shared a room all growing up, and so, you know, we definitely loved each other, and then we would hate each other when she stretched out my clothes or <laughs> refused to take me to the mall. <laughs> um, and then for John, he was the boy, and boy, my grandmothers both really love boys. Like, us girls were okay, but it was all about having that grandson to carry on the family. So, um, so yeah, so sometimes I, you know, loved him and sometimes I was a little mad at him for being, you know, so special. Um, but as we got older and older, my brother and I have gotten closer and closer. So, yeah, you go through, through seasons <laughs> with your siblings. <laughs> so do you guys see each other, like, only on holidays now? Yeah. Um, so I just saw them over Christmas. And then I don't know when I'm going to get to see my sister again right now. She's, I thought she was going to get to come up for a visit, but she owns several businesses and she cannot get away right now. So my brother's going to come up uh, and actually bring the boys and they're going to stay here for about a month this summer. So that's going to be fantastic. My brother has to go back to work, back to Texas for most of the month, but um, his wife and Courtney and the two boys, Jack and Liam, I get to hang out with us which is unreal so they are a little pipsqueaks and I can't wait to like take them to Maggie Daly Park and to the beach and just have fun oh yeah um so is there anyone that you look up to in your life um why do you look up to them mm. if you do yeah there's a lot of people to look up to aren't isn't there I mean there's people that you don't even know like People on the Supreme Court, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right? Just love that woman. I've never met her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and then there's the people in your own life. Um, I always looked up to my Nana, of course. Um, she meant the world to me. There's people in my professional life that I've gotten to know that I think like, oh, maybe someday I could do things half as amazing as what they're doing. Um, I don't know. I think, I think the people that I admire the most in my own life are people who have gone through hard times and have come out um, with their faith in the lead, people who have um, just persevered and trusted in God. And I think sometimes that's really hard to do, right, in the day-to-day. -day. Like, I know in my head what I'm called to do, what God calls us to do, how we're called to leave. But then it all breaks down, right? And I go home and I'm like, oh, why was I so petty? Why did I say those things? Like, why I should have been better, right? I should have helped more. I should have been 
more kind. Um, and it's the people who go through stuff a lot harder than I've ever dealt with, and they still manage to do it with grace and kindness and joy um, that I really look up to. So, like, there's a few women in my church, and and they're just, they're like that. You know, you wouldn't know their name, but um, I see how they carry themselves, and I, I just hope before I get too old, I can do do it as well as, like, they're doing it. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you could talk to anyone on the earth or spend a day with them, who would it be? They could be living or dead. Oh, you want a famous person? Doesn't matter. Oh, well, famous person would be Michelle Obama. If I could be that woman's friend, that would just be everything. <laughs> I'm like, you don't even know how much we have in common. And I'm sure in reality we don't, but in my brain, we do. Um, so, so I'm going to go with Michelle Obama. What is the idea? Why do you like her? Why do I like her? Um, I think I, I think it goes back to how well she carried herself, right? Um, I cannot imagine, of course I can't, but I cannot imagine um, being the first black female first lady, having your husband be the first black president. I think that would have been so overwhelming, so scary, right? Um, and she just blazed through there with keeping her own personality intact, being true to herself, right? Um, pushing forward some really, not just noble ideas, but things that we really need and things that create a tangible change, um, like school lunches and trying to help kids get healthier. I mean, that's just real. And she got that work done. And she's not even an elected official, <laughs> you know? Um, she didn't want that. She wrote about it in her book. Like she, did, she didn't want that position. She didn't want her husband to go into politics, let alone become president. Um, but when she was given the opportunity, she did the most with it that she possibly could. And she did it for others, not for herself. I think she was constantly aware that she was representing an underrepresented group. And she did that with incredible grace. And I think, I think people could see her faith in her and that's amazing that's amazing plus uh she's gorgeous and has great clothes so <laughs> who wouldn't want a friend like that <laughs> um what are your opinions on today's society so how does it make you feel seeing how the world is today and what would you change if you could oh gosh um I think we have to be really careful not to just lump everybody into the same categories or just a few basic categories, right? I, I think I try, truly try to see um, people as individuals and value where they're at. Um, having said that, right, there's um, a lot of talk in the media about the different generations, right? Millennials, Generation X now, right, and, and what they mean. and. I think what's really striking to me is, um, you know that phrase, like, you do you? That drives me insane. Just bananas. Like, the thought of entire groups of people, and that's all ages, all backgrounds. I mean, I've heard so many people use that kind of language. Um, but that idea of, like, you putting yourself in front of others, even at the cost of others. Okay, sorry for the interruption, mm -hmm. but continue. Thanks, Mr. O. Um, yeah, I just think that idea of you doing whatever it is that you want to do, even if it is at the cost of somebody else's freedoms, right? Somebody else's rights. Um, if it can get in somebody else's way, right? I, I don't think that's the kind of people we're called to be. We're called to put others first, right? And that doesn't mean to not be true to yourself, but I think when, when we're our true selves, the people that God has called us to be, we live in service of others. And I, I just wanna see people in our society here in America, people of all ages, from all kinds of neighborhoods, um, helping each other more, right? And considering what their actions mean to their neighbors, right? 
um, and not living in a silo. It's easy to throw our headphones on or roll up my car windows and just think everybody else is an idiot, <laughs> right? I get real angry when I drive. Like, no one else should be allowed to drive. Only I know how to drive, right? And I have to check myself in those moments and be like, you know, maybe it's me. <laughs> maybe it's me. Maybe I'm the one who needs to slow up and take my time and be more cautious and let people in, right? And I think that's not true just in driving. I think that's true in my whole life, right? I need to slow up and let other people in. I need to hear them. Um, I need to be curious about them. I need to understand their point of view and be open to changing my own mind, right? I need to hold the door. <laughs> I just, I, I need to see how I can serve somebody else and check my own implicit bias at the door, right? Um, and I hope as a society we can start to do that again. I think we did it at some points. And I think right now it's very popular to not care about others um, at really macro levels, right? You talk about the image, immigration discussions, for example. Um, and whatever you believe about that process, at the end of the day, we have people at our borders who are hurting physically. I mean, you can just look at them. They're physically hurting, right? And if you see someone who's in that kind of physical pain, you have to care for them, right? We have to care for them. It's that simple. Okay. This is a little different because he's kind of Okay, next question is how do you give such great advice? Is there a method to reading people? Oh, do I give great advice? I don't think I do. <laughs> you give such great advice all the time. Like literally. Oh. I I don't know. I should probably A I should probably less advice. <laughs> I should, I think I think what I tell myself is to try to listen more and talk less. Right. Um, but if I do offer advice, I, I want it to be biblically sound, right? I, I want it to reflect who we are as a people of faith. Uh, that's definitely number one. Um, and number two, I mean, I've done a lot of things in my life and I have failed a lot, right? So if I can pass on anything I've learned along the way in my own journey, um, just being honest and transparent about that, then I'm happy to do so right? You've probably heard the same stories from me over and over at this point. So, <laughs> um, And I have a really wise dad. My dad gives me great advice. I might just be repeating his words. <laughs> okay. Um, what is something about yourself that most people don't know about? Hmm. Well, I don't know how many people know, but my first job after college was being a morning news anchor. So yeah, I was in Joplin, Missouri. And I was on the morning show and the noon show, and it was just me and then the, our weather guy. And so I was on air with him for like four hours a day. And uh, I was very young. I mean, I was right out of school. So I got hired when I was 21. Um, and I wasn't just the anchor, I also was the executive producer of the show. So I was in charge of basically everyone that was in the building at that time of day, because it was so early, right? None of them the managers were there yet. So I was the most um, authoritative person. I was, the, and I was probably the youngest person at the same time. So that was wild. Uh, it was a lot of fun. It's where I met my husband. Um, but then the business changed a lot, you know, and when Jared and I started getting more serious about each other, we had to decide, do we want to have our careers or do we want to try and make this thing work? Um, so we both left journalism at that point, and I not regret it. So people ask me all the time if I wish I could go back or if I wish I'd never left, and um, I, no, no. We, we made the best decision. Can you talk to me a little bit about Jared? Oh, about Jared, of <laughs> course, of course. He's great. Uh, what do you want to know? Um, just like how he's affected your life, stuff like mm. that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so I married since 2007. Yeah, I did the math right, yeah. Um, and I met Jared in 2003. So 
there you go. Um, we don't have any kids and we live here in the city, in the South Loop. And I think we bring out the best of each other. I mean, he can be a bit of a homebody and I wanna go spend time with friends, right? So we balance each other out. Um, he, on paper, we probably had pretty similar upbringings, but in reality, you know, there's lots of differences between us, um, but it, it all seems to work. I think Jared's really good at encouraging, encouraging me to um, be my full self, right? Like he wants to see me using my gifts. He wants to see me um, putting myself out there. Like he, he never wants to hold me back. And that's a true gift, right? To have in a partner. Um, when we were getting married, Buster told us that it, we couldn't treat it like a 50-50 partnership because 50% is a failing grade, right? So instead, we both had to give 100% every time. And if we both were trying 100%, chances were we'd cover everything, right? Because there's just stuff in a marriage like I notice the dust, and Jared will never notice that it's dusty in the house. Never, ever, ever. And so I could get really mad at him and be like, you should dust half the furniture. Like, why don't you ever help dust? Um, but it's way better because I dust 100% of the furniture and he cleans 100% of the toilets. <laughs> let me tell you, it works out great. <laughs> like, we just both have 100%. Um, whenever we see something that needs doing, whenever we see a way to help each other, right? Um, we, we have to be there fully for each other. And he has certainly taught me how to do that and taught me how to um, care for someone else, how to be a better person in a lot of ways. Yeah. Aww, yeah. That's so cute. He is so cute. <laughs> um, do you have any regrets in life? And what are they? And why didn't you do or say that thing? Do you have any regrets? Oh, gosh. Um, regrets. Regrets are tricky. So I don't think there are things I regret in terms of doing or not doing. Um, I once heard that if you made the best decision you could with the information you had at the time, you can't ever regret that, right? You can't regret what you didn't know. <laughs> um, so in those terms, I don't. I do. I can have regrets. I can feel regretful if I have, um, if I've let like my tongue get away from me, right? And I've sp spoken ill of somebody else or just misspoken, um, and then my words can come back to haunt me. And I really, really hate it when I do that. Yeah, that's when you know you have to make amends, be the big, big person, and own up to what you did wrong. Yeah. Otherwise, you're living with regret. And a lot of the time, what you're regretting and what feels like such a big deal in your head isn't actually that big of a deal in somebody else's head, right? It's like anger in that way. Um, so you just keep hurting yourself, right? Until you just own up to it, talk it out with that person, and then realize, like, they're okay, and we're going to be okay. And now I this huge burden is off my shoulder. Like, wow, so much better. But I'm still learning those lessons. I have not mastered that yet. I don't think it's a short process to understand something like that. Yeah. <laughs> like you have to take a lot of time to understand something. Especially if like you don't want to forgive somebody because you're like... But, <laughs> um, if you could go back to any age in your life, which would it be and why? To any age? Like, yeah, like any age... You say you're younger. Oh, yeah. Well, let's see. I'm 37. I turn 38 in August. August 23, we'll be back in school. Go ahead and, you know, bring me a balloon. That'd be great. <laughs> I know. Please don't. Um, <laughs> so, I don't know. Kind of reaching, starting to inch close to middle age. Um, I think I was very serious from a pretty young age on. I was very serious high schooler. I did not mess around at all. Like if a teacher assigned me homework and they put a due date on it, they got it on time or sooner. Uh, it never, it literally never occurred to me to turn something in late or not turn it in at all. It blows my mind 
that students like don't don't do that. I I I think I would have felt so much pressure and guilt, and that was all coming from myself, right? But that's just how I was wired. Like I I was just very diligent. Um, and I went and I did that internship, and then I went off to this big college. I had been in a high school about the size of Holy Trinity. We had 400 students, and so I'm going to an out-of-state um, college like the University of Missouri with its tens of thousands of people was just crazy, right? Nobody did that from where I was from. And um, I went and I was very focused on my major, and I was focused on my future career, and I don't know that I like stopped and had enough fun along the way. <laughs> like I think I just want to. I think I would go back and tell myself like, it's gonna be okay. <laughs> None of it's gonna go the way you plan, but that's actually okay. And you can just lighten up a little bit. You can skip that one class that one time in college and survive. <laughs> uh, so do you think like being diligent is like a huge part of your life? like that characteristic? I think it is, yeah. I think um, professionally and personally, uh, I really am outcome driven, right? So I, I'm, I have a certain amount of pride in being highly productive. Um, I, I want to see that I'm doing something and it's making a difference and, a, and there's a tangible outcome from that. Um, so yeah, I push myself still. I, I I always have in every job. And in my personal life, I mean, I'm very diligent with my volunteer work and not with cooking. Not with cooking. Not so much there. But yeah, in a lot of other ways, um, I am. And I, I have a hard time relating to people who are not outcome driven. That's That's something I work on, right? People are like a little more esoteric. I'm like, yeah, but what are we gonna get done? <laughs> like, that was an interesting conversation, but where's the to-do list? <laughs> so. um, maybe that aspect is a good thing. Mm. Do you think it could be a good and bad thing? Yes, I th- yes, I think it can be a good and bad thing. I think, I don't know. Again, I think you know it's that advice to myself to lighten up a little bit. I could I could use some more of that. Okay, um, so you're always helping people and don't seem to realize the impact that you have. If there was anything you would want someone to do for you, what would it be? How would this act change your life? Oh my gosh. Oh, um, <laughs> what would I want somebody to do for me other than cook? <laughs> <laughs> Jared's a pretty good cook. I mean, if somebody showed up every day, like, with a, sm- a healthy smoothie, that would be that would be a life changer for me. <laughs> I'm not even joking. <laughs> so, like, left to my own devices, I would probably eat a tortilla that I warmed up in the microwave, <laughs> and that would be, like, it. <laughs> and, Is it flour or corn? And a lot of, oh, that's a good question. Oh, it's probably whatever was closest. (laughs) Although if it was corn, I would definitely put it on on my, like, fire grill instead of in the microwave, because that's just better. Um, Yeah, yeah, I would not, I do not do a good job of taking care of myself in terms of what I'm eating. I try. I think about it. In my head, there's a plan, <laughs> but when like it, when it, when I'm at work, especially, I'll just skip that to keep working, right? <laughs> and so, yeah, if somebody showed up with a green smoothie, no pineapple, that might be great. So like, <laughs> <laughs> was that what you were thinking of when you asked um, the question? <laughs> no, but it's interesting. <laughs> so, like, have you ever like looked up like recipes for different things and like tried them? Oh my gosh, yes. I like emailed myself literally this week. I emailed myself a list of smoothie recipes that I had researched. And then I went to Aldi and I bought ingredients for all of it. But actually making it, no. (laughs) Nope. Jared's like, so what are we going to do with 10 pounds of strawberries? And I'm like, I don't know. I can't. I can't. 
I can't. I just, I don't know. I wake up in the morning and I'm like, I need to take a shower and get out the door and get to work as soon as possible because I have so much to do. And so even though making a smoothie would literally take three minutes, <laughs> I just don't do it. I just want to get to work. <laughs> Like, so does your mom or your dad cook? Do they cook? Um, yes, they both cook. And they both are great cooks. Um, very healthy, very flavorful, um, very inventive. They're, they're really great cooks. And I think they spoiled me for a long time. <laughs> and the thing is, I can cook. I actually um, helped pay for college by working in catering. And I wasn't a server. I was in the kitchen making food for a frat house. It was a lot of fun. Let me tell you all about it sometime. Um, that was sarcasm. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, it paid. But I, I can cook. I just don't want to. <laughs> I can think of a million other things to do <laughs> that feel more important. Other than feed yourself? Other than feed myself. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a favorite food? My mom's lasagna. Is definitely my favorite food. Lasagna is yeah. it special. It is really special. My dad makes the gravy, which is like we're not Italian, but he thinks he is, so <laughs> that's what he calls the red sauce. And he takes like a whole day to make it. And then my mom makes the lasagna, and it is amazing. She tells me how unhealthy it is while I'm eating it, but it does not slow me down because no. it is that good. <laughs> yeah, it's so yummy. Okay, well, thank you for doing this interview with me, Miss Clark. Anytime, Chachi. Thank you for asking and for listening to all my nonsense. <laughs> and if you've no. learned anything today, make yourself a smoothie. <laughs> <laughs>